Today's episode is brought to you by Special, the independent streaming service connecting creators and viewers authentically and on demand. Stream independent. For more information, go to special.tv. The Director Series is made possible by the support of our subscribers on Special. Subscribe today at special.tv forward slash the Director Series and gain access to exclusive full length Director Series episodes and other bonus content ad free. The runaway success of Inglorious Bastards compelled Tarantino to continue with his production of ideas that had long been simmering on the proverbial back burner. Since 2007, he had been noodling around with writing a book on Italian director Sergio Corbucci, the man behind the hit 1966 spaghetti western Django. A good portion of his writing focused on what he perceived as Corbucci's fascination with the Wild West as an untamed landscape where the evils of fascism could flourish. The idea dovetailed with one Tarantino had in relation to his own work, in which his personal background as a son of Tennessee informed his desire to tell a story about the region's troubled history with slavery, albeit filtered through the pulpy revisionism that had come to fascinate him in recent years, and that had made Inglorious Bastards such a brazenly defiant take on World War II. Something about deflating the stuffiness of quote-unquote big-issue filmmaking was inherently appealing to Tarantino leading him to believe that sharper points about thorny historical issues could be made through the vernacular of genre storytelling. By marrying the conventions of the spaghetti western to the lush Spanish moss-draped backdrop of antebellum America, Tarantino could effectively construct his own subgenre, the Southern. The result would be 2012's Django Unchained, a textbook Tarantino take on America's uneasy relationship with its original sin, culminating with an Old Testament-style bloodbath that chooses retribution over reparation. Don't get so carried away with your retribution. You lose sight of why we're here. You think I lost sight of that? You're going to blow this whole charade, or more than likely get us both killed, and I for one don't intend to die in Chickasaw County, Mississippi. Shot yes. throughout California, Wyoming, and Louisiana on a $100 million budget over the course of 130 days, and with some of the highest profile names in American cinema among its cast roster, Django Unchained could quite easily position itself as Tarantino's biggest film up to that point. Set in the Deep South in the years before the Civil War, Django Unchained concerns itself with the plight of its namesake, a slave named Django, whose wife was ripped away from him after a failed escape attempt and sent away to another plantation, never to return. He is sent to auction himself, but on the way, he is rescued by Dr. King Schultz, an eccentric bounty hunter masquerading as a dentist. Schultz needs Django to identify a number of targets he's pursuing, but Django proves to be a formidable bounty hunter in his own right. The pair discover that Django's wife, Broomhilda, has been acquired by Calvin Candy, one of Mississippi's wealthiest and most feared slave traders. They infiltrate Candy's plantation compound in disguise as wealthy dealers of gladiatorial combat slaves, and subsequently set about trying to secure Broomhilda's freedom through duplicitous means. Unbeknownst to them, Calvin's confidant, an elderly slave named Stephen, senses their plot and works to root them out before they can con his beloved master. This being a Tarantino film and all, the performances are expectedly top-rate. The part of Django was initially written for Will Smith, but he turned it down because he thought, somehow, Django wasn't the lead. The part went to Jamie Foxx instead, his self-serious, grim demeanor giving the comedic moments an ironic flair that makes it all the more hilarious. He is convincing as the humorless, badass archetype, but he also shows a considerable ability to poke fun at himself. Christoph Waltz's two Oscar wins have both stemmed from his collaborations with Tarantino, the second of which is owed to his stealing nearly every scene as Dr. King Schultz, a radically different character than the previous one he played for his director. He's still German in nationality, but Schultz sports a full beard and a curious flair for monochromatic clothing. He's every bit as eccentric as Landa, prattling on in a verbose manner as he scuttles about the frontier in a rickety wagon with an oversized tooth swinging around on top. However, his jovial nature belies his deadly ferocity as a bounty hunter and marksman. As for the role of playboy slave trader Calvin Candy, Tarantino finally gets his man, successfully securing the services of Leonardo DiCaprio for a rare villainous turn. A wealthy southern charmer, Candy hides his villainy behind his warm hospitality. Make no mistake, though, he is a ruthless, volatile man not to be crossed. DiCaprio commits himself entirely to Tarantino's demented vision, unabashedly digging into his character's inbred, racist psyche and nefarious desires. 
The extent of his commitment can be witnessed in a scene where he smashes a skull in front of his dinner guests, bleeding out all over his hand. During the take used in the film, he actually cut his hand badly, yet continued to stay in character despite his own very real blood leaking all over the place. Tarantino's supporting cast is rounded out by a roster of new and familiar faces alike. As Broomhilda, Carrie Washington brings a much-needed femininity to Tarantino's machismo revenge tale. She appears to Django throughout the film as an ethereal vision amongst creation, and we feel that we've come to know her just as well as the other characters when we finally confront her flesh-and-blood form. Frequent Tarantino player Samuel L. Jackson returns as Candy's key confidant, Stephen. Acting under heavy prosthetics, he assumes an elderly, feeble affectation that enhances the comedic value of his impotent rage and suspicion. Seasoned character actor James Ramar plays two roles. One is Ace Speck, a gruff slave poacher, and Candy's silent associate, the bowler derby Butch Pooch. Miami Vice star Don Johnson plays Big Daddy, a Colonel Sanders-esque plantation owner, rival to Candy and progenitor of the Ku Klux Klan. There's also a few notable cameos peppered throughout the film. Jonah Hill stands out, playing Big Daddy's son and a fellow proto-Klansman. Death Proof star Zoe Bell plays a masked tracker who silently lurks in the fringes of her scenes, her role reportedly part of a much larger subplot that was ultimately cut. Michael Parks, so memorable as Texas Sheriff Earl McGraw in both Kill Bill and Death Proof, plays a sun-baked poacher here. Tarantino himself also pops up in the same scene as an Aussie-accented poacher. Working again with cinematographer Robert Richardson, Tarantino captures the expansive vistas of the West and the sun-dappled willow trees of the South in stunning 35mm photochemical beauty. Utilizing the 235 to 1 aspect ratio, Tarantino opts for a richly realized cinematic look, complete with deep contrast, natural earth tones, and bold saturated primary colors. A tobacco tint casts a nostalgic glow over the Mississippi sequences during the day, and at night is replaced by a handsome amber candlelight that romanticizes the otherwise horrific Candyland plantation. Flashback sequences are even more stylized, employing a low contrast bleach bypass technique to suggest faded, heat baked film. The camera work adapts to the scale of the story, favoring sweeping crane shots reminiscent of old spaghetti westerns, as well as frenetic rack zooms typical of the grindhouse genre. Beyond Richardson, Django Unchained finds Tarantino working with a host of new collaborators, replacing several of his key craftspeople for reasons both known and unknown. For only the second time in Tarantino's career, Lawrence Bender isn't a producer. The responsibility instead goes to Pilar Savone, Stacey Scher, and more odiously, the disgraced brothers Weinstein. Tarantino's usual production designer David Wasco sits out this round as well, with the late J. Michael Riva filling in to create an embellished sense of the antebellum period. And finally, due to Sally Menke's passing in 2010, Django Unchained finds Tarantino working with a new editor for the first time since his career began. Fred Raskin more than compensates for Menke's absence by crafting an explosive, exhilarating edit that proficiently captures Tarantino's storytelling dynamics in a way that feels continuous with his earlier films. The soundtrack is classic Tarantino, featuring obscure needle drops that give the film a unique, offbeat, and vintage vibe. For the first time, Tarantino also uses original songs commissioned for the film, but not an original score. As a result, contemporary artists like John Legend and Rick Ross share album space with Johnny Cash, Wagnerian Opera, and the spaghetti western sounds of the late Ennio Morricone. It's an incredibly eclectic mix that favors Morricone's sound more than any others due to the genre it deals in. Oddly enough, Morricone would later state his desire not to work with Tarantino again due to what he described as the director's quote, incoherent approach to film music. Time would eventually heal this particular wound, but it no doubt must have been devastating to Tarantino on a personal level to have one of his heroes disparage his work in this manner. Despite its reckoning with the evils of slavery, Django Unchained echoes Inglorious Bastards in its gleeful embrace of cartoonish violence. The contempt Tarantino feels for fascist individuals like Hitler or collective groups like Candy's plantation crew is palpable in the vindictiveness with which he stages their comeuppance. Where Inglorious Bastards pumps Hitler with a fusillade of bullets in two separate instances, Django Unchained's climactic reckoning sees veritable geysers of blood vomit from bullet wounds, while expressionistic sound design gives each bullet the weight of a bomb. Tarantino presents the bloodshed as a cathartic act, a safe space for the victims of hate to fantasize about their oppressor's violent demise. 
This approach is obviously not without its problems. Beyond surface debates about good taste, it's understandable that some may take offense to the idea of a white man avenging slavery through artistic means. Spike Lee is still furious about it. That said, racial politics have always played a part in Tarantino's work. Yes, it's true that the N-word flies around carelessly throughout this film and others. Political correctness has never been his strong suit. But yet, he continues to remain uncancelled when others have been so quickly dumped or abandoned for similar behavior. There's no one reason why this is. Perhaps it's his character's high degree of self-awareness, or the undeniably satirical nature of his artistic voice that, similar to TV shows like South Park, uses shock value and crude humor to expose and dismantle, rather than preserve, imbalanced power structures and societal iniquities. Regardless of controversy, or perhaps even because of it, the release of Django Unchained would continue in Glorious Bastard's success with critics and at the box office, further escalating Tarantino's resurgent upward momentum. Indeed, it would best the performance of his previous film by most established metrics. At $425 million in worldwide receipts, it set a new box office record for Tarantino and would earn him his second Oscar for original screenplay. Twenty years after his breakout with Reservoir Dogs, he was still on top of the industry. Few filmmakers remain as relevant or forceful within the same time span. That he keeps scoring hit after hit is a testament to his innate talent and singular vision. Though the archetype of the Tarantino film has been clearly defined for two decades, he has achieved longevity in a fickle business by continuing to surprise and subvert our expectations. That he's embraced storylines that don't conform to the established records of history creates an unpredictable and exciting environment where literally anything can happen. We truly never know what we're in for when we sit down to watch a new Tarantino film for the first time, but we do know it will be a wild and unforgettable ride.